Hi, this is Matt McCormick. I'm in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. Uh, my email address is mccormick at csus.edu. This is my second lecture on conditional probability for my um, inductive logic class, and our reading from which some of this is based is Hacking's Inductive Probability and Intro Introduction to Probability and Inductive Logic, Chapter 5. Um, and I'm going to jump right in here with a quick review of our last lecture, and then we're going to do some much harder problems. Okay, so we learned that the conditional probability rule is this thing. It's written out that way with A's and B's, and you've got to get it memorized and recognize what it is and how it stands. And we're going to be working entirely within that formula. And what we've learned to do is we form the problem to the CP rule. When we've got a, we're a word problem to solve, we use some other uh, abbreviations to stand in for A and B. Usually for me, I use it so I can help remember what I'm talking about. Um, then we draw a pruned tree to capture the probabilities of the problem that we're looking at. And then we get the values from the tree for the formula. And we often have to use the multiplication rule and the addition rule for the denominator. That is, the thing that goes down here at the bottom of the rule. OK, so here's a problem, a harder problem. Suppose 80% of the taxis at the airport are yellow, 20% are orange. Yellow cabs are involved in 35% of the accidents, and orange cabs cause 10% of the accidents. You hear over the speaker that a cab was in an, in an accident in the terminal. What's the probability that it was an orange cab? OK, so our question then is, we draw a tree, and we're trying to solve this equation. What's the probability it was orange given that it was in an accident? The pro that's the probability that it's orange and it's in an accident over the total probability of accidents. And there's our tree. 80% of the cabs are yellow, 20% are orange, and of the yellow ones, 35% are in accidents, and of the orange ones, 10% are causes of the accidents. So now we've got a pruned tree, and we plug in the values. So the probability that it's orange and it's in an accident is uh, 0.2 times 0.1. That's this combination of events. It's both orange and it's in an accident. That's 0.02. And the probability of a cab being in an accident is either by way of an orange one, which is that same number, um, this way, or it might be that it's a yellow cab that's in an accident, and those probabilities are 0.8 times 0.35. The probability that this two things would happen, uh, so we multiply there, and that adds up to 0.3. So you'll recall from last time that our denominator now is a conjunct of all the ways that a cab could be in an accident. It's either an orange cab or a yellow cab. And this captures all of them. That's 30% of them. So when you do uh, plug in those numbers, 0.02 over 0.3, you get 0.066. So now we have an answer. What's the probability that the cab was orange given that it was in an accident? That probability is only 6%. And when you look at it, that kind of makes sense. Because look, most of the cabs at the airport are yellow. 80% of them are yellow. And they cause a lot more of the accidents. So um, the odds that it's an orange cab are really low. That means it's about 95% chance that it was a yellow cab. If you do this number minus uh, 1 minus this number to get the other number. All right, so there's an example of the CP rule and using a tree and plugging in the values to get the result for the answer. OK, here's a harder one. Suppose you're at a conference that has 45 programmers from Google and 55 programmers from Facebook. That conveniently adds up to 100. And 33% of the Google programmers work on artificial intelligence. 21% of the Facebook programmers work on artificial intelligence. You meet one of the programmers randomly from the group. Her name is Kelly, and she works on AI. What's the probability that she works for Google? OK, so part of the problem here is figuring out how to set up the problem. Um, we're trying to figure out what's the probability she works for Google given that she works on AI. So there's the tree, 4555 Google and Facebook programmers. And then among the Google programmers, there's 33% are AI people. And among the Facebook programmers, there's 21% AI people. And the question is this. Um, what's the probability she works for Google, given that she works on AI? And plugged into the values, we get this equation. So now um, we can pull those numbers off the tree. 45 times 33 is 0.1485. 
and the probability that someone, some randomly chosen programmer at the conference works on AI means they either have to be a Google AI person, which is this conjunct, or a Facebook AI person, which is this one. So it must be that they are this or this, in which case we add. So we add those two numbers, giving us the denominator. And now we can plug those values in and get 0.1485 over 0.264, which equals 56. Okay, so now we have an answer. What's the probability she works for Google? Given that she works in AI, uh, the probability is 56%. So probably she's from Google. 44% of uh, chance that she's from uh, Facebook. All right, I hope that makes sense. Uh, here's a more complicated one. Here's one with three um, initial possibilities. McCormick takes three different routes to work. He takes 65th Avenue 25% of the time. He takes 58th Avenue 25% of the time. And he takes Stockton 50% of the time. When he takes 65th Avenue, he's stuck in traffic and late 15% of the time. When he takes 58th Avenue, he's late 5% of the time. And the Stockton route makes him late 2% of the time. He's late today. Which route did he take? Okay, so this is tricky. It's more complicated in a couple different ways. So first off, I should point out that we've been doing trees with just two branches, but a tree can work as well, just as well with three or more branches as long as they're mutually exclusive. So the total ways that McCormick gets to work are by way of 65th, Stockton, or 58th Avenue. And notice these add up to 100%, 25, 50, and 25. So I just read those numbers off the problem to give the initial distribution of the different probabilities of which ways McCormick goes to work. But we're asking for the next question, which is, um, what are the rates at which he's late given those different routes? Okay, so if he goes by way of 65th, he's late 15% of the time. Stockton, he's late 2% of the time. And 58th, he's too late 5% of the time. And again, I just read those off of the problem and plugged them in here. So now we're in a position to be able to understand what we're asking. Um, a couple of things to point out here. So first off, um, we've got three options we're trying to solve, and we want to know which route did he take. Well, the hint I'm offering here is solve for one of these, doesn't matter which, pick one of them, and solve it. And if one of these is over 50%, then that means the other two conjoined have to be less than 50%. Um, so that means you have the answer. Um, or you can just keep solving for the other options, and I'll show you how to do that first. Let's just solve for 65th Avenue. So we're asking, given that he's late, what's the probability he took 65th Avenue? Or what's the probability he took 65th, given that he's late, plugged into the conditional probability rule looks like this, and now we can read those values off of the chart over there. All right, so look at this for a second. What's the probability he took 65th Avenue? That's a 25% distribution. He does that 25% of the time. And 25, in, in those 25% of the cases, he's late 15% of the time. So we're asking on the numerator, what's the odds that he did both 65th Avenue and he was late? Now, what is this big complicated business on the bottom, the denominator? Well, this is all the ways that he's late. He's either late by way of 65th Avenue, he's late by way of Stockton, or he's late by way of, of 58th Avenue. And what this does is gives, gives us an exhaustive list of all the ways he's late this way, or he's late this way, or he's late this way. And I read those off of the uh, tree over here to give me the full denominator. So you can think of it this way, like this fraction captures um, all of the ways, the probabilities for McCormick's being late by way of the three routes. And the particular question we're asking is, what's the ratio of the 65th Avenue late occurrences to the total late occurrences? So the 65th Avenue late occurrences are the numerator over the total late occurrences, which is the denominator. And that makes a lot of sense, at least to me, put that way. All right, so we've solved the values. We get 0 0.01 over 0 0.06 once you calculate or multiply and add all those numbers, which adds up to 0.625. All right, so what did we just answer? We just answered the question, what's the probability he took 65th Avenue given that he's late? You can imagine you're sitting in class, McCormick's late, and you know this, some of this information about the background, and you do the calculation to figure out, okay, which way did he come? 
Well, this tells you, this calculation we just did tells you, there's a 62% chance he's late by way of, of 65th Avenue. He came that route. And what that means is that the other two have to add up to what is that 37.5%. So the other two total, Stockton and 58th Avenue, um, are going to add up to 37.5% of the uh, other late occurrences. So probably he took 65th if he's late today. He might have taken one of the others, but probably by um, a margin of 60, 0.625, he took the other two. Okay, now I'm going to jump to the solve the other two problems, and I want you to take note of the denominator right here. This denominator, this 0.06, which is the number you get when you add and multiply all these, this denominator stays the same for the other two solutions. All right, so here's the same tree, and we're going to solve the other two questions. What's the probability he took 58th Avenue given that he's late? Well, that's this numerator over that same denominator, the total ways in which he's late. So now we use the same denominator as before, and we put as the numerator this, 0.25 times 0.05. That's this, the 58th Avenue um, a proportion of being late. And that calculated gives us 20%. Okay, so 20% chance that he's late by way of 58th Avenue. And then you can solve it for Stockton, too, the very same way. And now you get 0.16666. All right, so now here's the probabilities for all three answers. He's late. What's the probability he came from 60? He came by way of 65th. That was, um, what did we find out? 6.625. He's late, what's the probability he came by way of 58th? That's 0.2. He's late, what's the probability he came by way of Stockton? That's 0.166. And notice that all of those add up to 1, which is 100% of the late cases. He always comes by way of one of those three options, and if he's late, it's going to have to be by one of those. So those are exhaustive and complete. So we've just solved three problems in that case. Uh, okay. Here's another problem that's similar to the critical thinking A problem we looked at in the last lecture. Patrick either took inductive logic from McCormick or from Vandergriff. McCormick teaches 73% of the inductive logic students, and Vandergriff teaches the rest, which is 27%. 15% of McCormick students get a score over 150 on the LSAT, and 75% of Vandergriff students do get a score of 150, over 150 on the LSAT, because Vandergriff is a much better teacher. Patrick got a score over 150 on the LSAT. Who did he take inductive logic from? So the given, or the observation here, is that Patrick got over 150 on the LSAT. I'm just going to use LSAT to stand for that. And what we're asking for is this question. We're going to solve for McCormick. The question is, who did he take inductive logic from? It doesn't matter whether you solve for McCormick or for Vandergriff. We'll figure out the other one from the first. So let's solve it for McCormick. What's the probability that Patrick took inductive logic from McCormick given that he got over 150 on the LSAT? Well, it's the probability that he took it from McCormick and he got 150 over 150 on the LSAT over the probability, the total probability they got over 150 on the LSAT. And I'm just going to say LSAT from now on. Okay, so our tree then shows 73% of the students go to McCormick, 27 go to Vandergriff, and then of McCormick's, 15% make it through, get to this threshold on the LSAT, and 75% of Vandergriff's get on this, pass this threshold on the LSAT. So now we can plug those values in um, and uh, do the calculations, and we get an answer of 0.35. Okay, so given that Patrick got over 150 on the LSAT, that means there's a 35% chance he got it by way of McCormick's class and a 65% chance he got it by way of Vandergriff's class. That's what we learned from drawing this tree and using the conditional probability rule to figure it out. So you can pause that, take a look at that, and sort of absorb the details. All right, so uh, some more relevant and complicated problems. For her demographic, there's only a 5% chance that Lynn is pregnant but she tested positive with a cheap drugstore pregnancy test that's only 75% accurate. So don't ask me why she tested. Um, let's just assume she did. Um, so she got a really cheap test that's only 75% accurate. That's not very accurate at all. Um, and the question is, is she pregnant? 
Okay, so you're going to get used to these problems. I do lots of these problems because they're very graphic and they make it very clear. We're asking, what's the probability that she's pregnant given that she tested positive? That equals the probability that she's pregnant and she tested positive over the, prob the total probability of testing positive. Um, okay, so those numbers then are these numbers. The probability that she's pregnant is only 5%. That is, I pulled this, this number right here that says at the outset there's a base rate of, of her only being 5% pregnant, likely to be pregnant, um, and then she got a, a test that's 75% accurate, she got a positive result. Okay, so we've asked for these two events. What are the odds that a pregnant woman would get a positive result? Well, the test is 75% accurate, so the odds are 75% that she would. Um, I'll say that one more time. Since the test is 75% accurate, we might ask, well, what are the odds that she would get a positive test result given that she's pregnant? In this case, 75%. Whereas, if she's not pregnant, what are the odds she'd get a positive test result? Well, it's a 75% accurate test, so that means 25% of the not pregnant women actually test positive. So look at this situation. Here's a not pregnant woman, a 25% chance she'll actually test positive, right? Um, okay, so that's the two ways that you can get a positive test result. This is a true positive test result, a pregnant woman, 75% test positive. Here's a false positive result, a non-pregnant woman, that's what that tilde means, a non-pregnant woman test positive at 25% rate in this case. So Lynn has got to be either pregnant or not pregnant at these odds. And then this event is going to happen at a 75-25% ratio for those two situations that she's in. And that means then that the total probability underneath and the denominator is both of those numbers added together. So we run those numbers, you calculate it, you get an answer of about 14%. Okay, so what does that mean? What's the probability of Lynn's pregnant? 14%. She started out at 5%. She's now got a positive test result. She's only gone up to 14. Now, that's a bit surprising. It's a bit counterintuitive. Why? Well, there's two reasons why that number is still so low. Because we tend to think, well, if you get a positive test result, you must be pregnant. No, it really depends on the situation. It depends on the base rates, and it depends on the accuracy of the test. And in this case, we've got a really low, a pretty low base rate. Lynn is pretty unlikely to be pregnant to start with, and this is a pretty crappy test. It's only 75% accurate. I mean, a coin toss is 50%, so this is not as good a test as we want. You want to get a better test. Um, so Lynn went from 5 to 14. She's still probably not pregnant but maybe she wants to take another test to be sure to find out. And I'll show you what happens when you do that with these COVID cases. Uh, so now we're getting real. Now we're getting to some real examples like you have to live with. Um, Matt just got exposed by spending an hour singing in a closed room with a church choir where the tenor has COVID. His odds of getting it in this situation are 0.3, let's just say. I'm just going to stipulate. 30% chance after you do that that you've got it. So he goes to Kaiser, he takes a test, it's 85% accurate, and he gets a positive test result. Question, question of the day, question of the year. All of you watching this have probably had a COVID test at this point. Does Matt have COVID? Here's how you figure it out. 30% chance he's got COVID, 70% chance he doesn't. So that's the first question. And then he tests, and for People who have COVID, there's an 85% chance with this test you'll test positive. For people who don't have COVID, there's a 15% chance they'll test positive. So I've got a pruned tree that just shows, shows the positives. And we're asking this question. What's the probability you've got COVID given you tested positive? Well, that's the probability you've got COVID and you tested positive over the probability you tested positive. So those numbers plugged in then, drawn off the tree, give us this number. So Matt went from a situation where uh, his base rate or his initial, his prior probability of having COVID was 30%, and the, the test, which is 85% accurate, comes back positive. Does he have it? That elevated our answer to the question to 0.7. So he's getting probable to have it. Like, he's probably got it. Now, that's not a 98 
but that's a lot higher than 30%. 30% he probably didn't have it, but now that you've got this new information and the test is added to our knowledge um, and we crank it through the conditional probability rule, we get an answer of 70%. So he's probably got it. All right, so another problem, a different problem to illustrate the base rate and test accuracy issue. So Sam got exposed to singing in the choir too from the tenor who turns out that's how you get COVID is that people expirating, um, uh, uh, giving off all these small respiratory particles like breathing the droplets in their air. That's why we're all wearing masks now. Um, but Sam is only 12, so his probability of getting it in these circumstances is only 0.1. Okay, in the previous problem, we put my base rate, Matt's base rate at getting COVID at 30%. Sam has got a lower initial or lower prior probability because he's 12 and kids don't get it very easily. So we'll put his initial, his prior probability at 10%. But he takes a test, the same test, 85% accurate and test positive. The question is, does he have it? Okay, so same test, same accuracy for the test, I believe, but we'll get a different base rate. Let's see what happens. When somebody's got a different initial situation or a different prior and there's a, a different um, initial uh, uh, probability about whether or not they've got it, that's going to change the results on the rule when we crank it out. So here's uh, Sam's um, tree, prune tree. It looks very much like the last one, except now we got 0.1 and 0.9, whereas before we had 30 and 70. And then here's the question we're answering. This is the same old problem. What's the probability he's got COVID given he tested positive? And you draw those numbers off of the tree, you add the denominator, and you get 0.38. Okay, so what did we discover? In the last case, Matt started at 0.3 and a positive test elevated him to 0.7. In this case, Sam started at 0.1 and a positive test elevated him to 0.38. So he probably still doesn't have it. And why did we get that result? It's because his prior was different. His base rate was different. His initial uh, probability of having it was different. That's why it matters about um, pregnancy, for example, what Lynn's base rates are and so on. Okay, so there's uh, two problems to illustrate what happens when you just change that uh, base rate number. Uh, now, let's look what happens when you do this. Suppose Sam is still worried um, about his exposure, so he gets tested again with that same test, it's 85% accurate, and he gets a positive test result. Now does he have COVID? He went from 0.1 to 0.38. Now he's got another positive test result. Does that enough, is enough to tip the balance? Okay, so now we've got a different tree to draw. Look at the way I've drawn the tree now. What's the prior or the initial probability that Sam has COVID? Well, in the beginning it was only 0.1, but then he took a test and it was positive, so that elevated him to 0.38. So we're gonna use that 0.38 here because now we're looking at the second test. So now it's 38, he has COVID, 62, he does not. And we're looking at the same test, 85 and 15. And now his base rate has changed because of the first test. So we plug in the values uh, to the equation, and now Sam goes up to 77. Okay, so Sam went from 0.1 uh, to 0.38 with the first test, positive test. And the second positive test now puts him at 77% likely to have it. So two positive results start looking pretty good that he's got it. What happened? We got new evidence, and if you're in doubt, you should test again. So we've added all this new information. Initially, we only thought he was 10%. One test that tells us some information and suggests that he does have it. Conditional probability rule crunches that number and gives us a ratio of um, what does that do to that first base rate. And then another test does the same. And you can anticipate that if, if Sam had taken this test again and gotten a negative result, it would have nullified um, the last result. So now you've got a positive test and a negative, result, negative test, and those cancel each other out, so he goes back to his initial base rate, which is 0.1. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to show you a much harder, more tricky sort of problem, and this is going to be pro solving for one of the other variables in the equation. Uh, so this will take a while to sort of talk through and think about. So let's assert that Mary is um, probability 20% that she's pregnant. Suppose she took a test and she got a positive result. Now the question is, how accurate or reliable does the test need to be 
for that positive test result to make it reasonable to start believing that she's pregnant. Okay, so a couple of things to say here. Hint, um, when, when does it start becoming reasonable to believe something? Well, we're treating 0.5 as a threshold. So anytime you get an answer that's over 0.5, you should start believing. Maybe just a little bit, but you should start believing more and more as it goes further and further north of 50. So we're asking what kind of, te what kind of positive test is going to push her up to 0.5 as the answer? Notice we've been answering all along. Well, now we're going to assert and figure this out from the beginning. So here's, here's the equation. What's the probability she's pregnant given she's positive? It just equals that same thing we've been doing for pregnancy and COVID and all that. And here's a different tree. Because now we're asking about the accuracy or the reliability of the test. We're asking about this number here, and we don't know what it is. So, so Mary is 20% likely to be pregnant, 80% she's not pregnant. And we're wondering about these positives, like how probable does this positive right here need to be in order for this number to be 0.5 or greater? I'll say that one more time and watch my cursor. How probable does this test need to be right here in order for this number to come out to be 0.5 or greater? All right, so here's what that is plugged in. We're asking, I'm going to set the answer, um, the conditional probability answer at 0.5. And now we're solving for this x in this equation. We're solving for x over here. Now, why is this 1 minus x over here? You can go back and look at the previous example, the one with Lynn. Um, this is a false positive case. So however accurate this test is, suppose it's 90%, then 1 minus 90% is going to be the false positive rate and give us this number here. Because this is a case where somebody's not pregnant, tilde pregnant, and she gets a positive. So these two numbers have to add up to 1. So x plus 1 minus x is going to equal to 1. So, and the other trick here is understanding that reasonable means 50%. So we're wondering about the answer. At what point does it become 50% likely or greater that Mary's pregnant on, on a test that's accurate? And we're going to solve the accuracy rate. So I just plugged in x for positive here, and x here comes down, and 1 minus x is this rate. We're asking for that solution. Okay, so now things get more complicated because we've got to solve for x. And it's not hard, but all you've got to do is I'm going to multiply the numerator, so I get 0.2x. I'm going to multiply the denominator, you get 0.2x. And then I multiply this 0.8 times 1 minus x, so I get 0.8 minus 0.8x. So all I've done is just multiplied through and gotten rid of the parentheses. Then I combine like terms in the denominator. So I put this 0.2x and this minus 0.8x together to get minus 0.6x, and I've still got this 0.8. So now the denominator is getting more simple. So I've combined like terms in the denominator. And now I've done something tricky, but this is obvious from your algebra class in high school. I want to get rid of the fraction. So I, on the right-hand side of this equation, I've got a fraction. What I'm trying to do is solve for x. So I want to isolate x on one side of this equivalence, or this equals. And so I'm going to get rid of the fraction because it's messy and hard to deal with. So the way to get rid of the fraction is to multiply both sides by the denominator. Because if I multiply the right-hand side by the denominator, the denominator goes away, and the right hand and the left-hand side then gets multiplied by the same denominator. Because one of the rules of math is that I can do anything I want to both sides of an equivalence and both sides of an equation as long as I do the same thing to both sides. If x is equal to y and I multiply both by 10, then they're still equal. So I multiply both sides by 0.8 minus 0.6x, and I get this equation. And then I multiply through... Um, so now I just multiply these numbers on the left-hand side, and um, I've also added 0.3x to both sides. So what happens here is that um, if I multiply through here, I'm going to get 0.4 minus 0.3x. And if I add 0.3x to both sides, I end up getting the x isolated on the right-hand side, and there's no x on the left now. 
So I'm starting to isolate and get x sit, sitting by itself. Um, if you do the math on that and look at that long enough, you'll see how I did. I skipped a couple steps there, but you can see it. Uh, now, what do I do to isolate x? Divide both sides by 0.5. What do I do to get x isolated? I divide both sides by 0.5, which makes the 0.5 go away on this side, and 0.4 divided by 0.5 equals 0.8. Okay, so this is really cool. What did we just do? We just solved and we just decided that if the test is 80% accurate or greater and she gets a positive result, then Mary is pregnant, or at least she's 0.5 pregnant. If this test number was higher, this 0.5 would go higher. But we solved it for the threshold. 0.5 is the threshold where you start believing things. And we solved the accuracy, or solved the, the accuracy of the test, for the 0.5 threshold. So that means that if the test is at least 80% um, accurate, and she gets a positive result, then she should start believing that she's pregnant. And the trick is seeing in the problem that that's what's being asked for, and seeing that we're asking to solve for something on the other side of the equation. Previously, we've been solving for the stuff on the left-hand side of the equation. Okay, so here's another example. Um, suppose that you're only 15% sure that you've got the coronavirus. How accurate would a test have to be for it in order uh, for a positive test result to be 0.7 convincing that you've got it? Okay, so in the previous case, we wondered um, that Mary started believing at 0.5. Now I've just stipulated, okay, we want a belief threshold at 0.7. How accurate does the test have to, have to be in order for me to, to be 70% um, or more convinced that I've got it? So now we're just solving and doing the very same sort of problem, but instead of solving for 0.5, we're solving for 0.7. I'll uh, let you look at that for a second. So here's our equation. We're still solving for the accuracy of the test. We have the very same uh, tree, and now I'm solving for p and 1 minus p instead of x. It's the same difference. It's just a variable. And I plug those values into the equation. Um, and then I start multiplying to get, out, get things reduced down. So that works out to be, um, to get rid of the parent parentheses on the top and the bottom, the denominator, I get this. And then I combine like terms to get this denominator. And then I multiply both sides by the denominator to get rid of the fraction. That leaves me with this line. And then I multiply in to get this line, 0.7 times that um, parenthetical equals this business here. And then I subtract, let's see, how did I do this? Um, add 0.49p to both sides to get rid of the p on the left and get the p's isolated on the right. And then divide both sides by 0.64. And now I get an answer to, what does uh, P have to be? 0.595, sorry for the pagination there. 0.595 divided by 0.64 equals 0.929. Okay, so what did we decide? What did we just show? If the threshold for believing is 70%, and that's all the way back up here at the start, we want to know how good does the test have to be to convince me? if I'm only 15% sure to start with? And the answer is, I have to be, that test has to be pretty good. It has to be 93% accurate to get me to the 70% believing threshold for one case. All right, so there's another example where we solved for B in the equation instead of solving for um, the conditional probability case. Uh, fairly simple once you start to see the pattern and see how it works. All right, so here's another one that's a little more tricky. Suppose, now we're going to solve for A in the equation. Suppose you don't know the distribution of coronavirus among people on a cruise ship, but you've got a test that's 94% accurate. You grab a random passenger and you conclude with 70% probability that she has it. What's the distribution of coronavirus on the ship? Okay, so this is weird and tricky. Um, what we've been given here is the answer. The answer is um, 0.7. And we know that the accuracy of the test is 0.94, so we've got some information, and we get this kind of equation now. So notice before we were solving for this number over here, now we're solving for this initial distribution of coronavirus. 
Um, this is like health officials show up at the Princess Cruise dock um, in San Francisco, and everybody's freaking out because there's COVID on the on the ship, and you want to know, uh, well, how many people have it before I let you off and let you come into the city? Well, we take a random passenger. Maybe we can't test them because there's 3,000 of them. So I take one random passenger, and I test them, and I know my test is good. I know my test is 90, 94% accurate. So I test them, and then I work backwards using this math to figure out what's the probability of, uh, of people having COVID coronavirus, uh, uh, COVID, in the cruise ship at large? Um, what's the distribution, uh, the base rate distribution of coronavirus in the, in the population? So now we're solving the equation this way. Um, we concluded 70% accurate that this person has it with a 94% accurate test. So we plug in the values and pull the numbers off the tree. We get this equation and we multiply through, get rid of the parentheses, multiply through, add and combine like terms, we get this equation, multiply both sides by the denominator to isolate P and get rid of the fraction, so I get this equation, um, multiply again and start combining terms, and then move, um, uh, subtract from both sides to get this equation, and then divide both sides by 0.324 to get this answer. That is, um, the, the distribution of COVID on this ship, according to this problem, is about 13%. If I've got a 94% accurate test and I get a 70% confidence positive test result on somebody who's randomly chosen, then that leads me to believe that 13% of the people on the ship have it. And isn't that amazing? We just checked with one person and we used our test and used other information we knew to infer backwards and figure out what the state or what the situation on the ship was, um, which isn't as bad as we might have thought. Um, okay, so what are the lessons here? A bunch of lessons. Uh, with new information, new tests, we have revised probabilities. We learned about how moving that from one test to the next uh, improves the odds or changes the odds. The test is information that must be folded into our new conclusion. Even with a relatively poor accuracy test, it can give us a lot of information, especially if you do it multiple times. Um, if the base rate is low, a positive test or observation, even a relatively accurate one, might be wrong. That is, we saw a case where somebody had, you know, really unlikely to be pregnant. She gets a positive test result. She's still probably not pregnant because the base rate was so low. Um, so that's important. Never ignore base rates. We're going to learn that from Kahneman, too, later. More evidence is better. It helps us uh, improve on and figure out what we're trying to um, solve. And we also learned that we can solve for A or for B in these equations if we have the other information, like the probability of A given B, by working backwards. We did that for two different cases where we inserted a new variable in for either the accuracy of the test or the distribution of the property. And then we used one minus that number to get the other side. And then we worked backwards and solved it mathematically. Okay, so that's the end of our second lecture on conditional probability. There's the rule which you should know very well now. And we've been drawing trees, forming the problem to the conditional probability rule. We get the values from the tree for the formula. We often have to use the multiplication rule and the addition rule for the denominator. You've seen lots of cases like that, and I've explained those. When the base rates are low, even an accurate test can be wrong. It can still be probable that somebody's not pregnant or doesn't have COVID. More evidence, more tests should be incorporated into our conclusions. And we can also solve for A or B when we have the probability of A given B and we work backwards with the information and solve it mathematically the other direction. Uh, and that's it. That's our two lectures on conditional probability for class.